Hey everyone, Coco Water Coder here, aka Coco, and welcome to another episode of Cypher. Uh, as you can see here, it's not actually Saturday when I'm recording this. Um, like I mentioned in my last Python challenge video, I had a personal emergency uh, last week that prevented me from recording when I wanted to. Uh, and the best thing was just for me to get my head straight uh, instead of trying to rush out a video. So this Saturday, uh, after this video, there will be two more videos, uh, one on uh, the frequency analysis, like a different approach to it, and then uh, on the Visioneer Cypher. Um, so the big thing that I want to highlight in this uh, is that for both this frequency analysis video and then the next one, um, they did not end up working for me. Um, and I think it's just as important um, to show failures as it is to show successes. Uh, I feel like computer science can be very, uh, or people in computer science can be kind of like perfectionists uh, and don't want to display them not knowing how to do something and not knowing the answer to something. Um, and if we're going to claim that it's a science, then we have to be willing to experiment and we have to be willing uh, to show our process, even if it doesn't end the way that we want it to. So that's what this is going to be. This is actually the third time that I'm recording this video. The first time, the vibe just wasn't right. Uh, it just wasn't going the way I wanted to. And then I did manage to record uh, the video yesterday, but it ended up being two hours long. Uh, and that's just way too long. I, like, if you've seen my other videos, I don't do a whole lot of editing. I'm not an editor. You know, I just like programming. Uh, and I wanted to share uh, my journey uh going through you know the code book and also the python challenge editing and taking all the time to edit doesn't really um suit me it's not something that i enjoy doing so two hours is kind of the two hours is just two hours raw uh, it's just way too long so i'm trying a different approach um i won't be doing like a code along that i've been doing um just because it it takes way too long uh, and it's very easy to get lost and for me to um, lose my train of thought when, when I'm doing this particular uh, approach of frequency analysis. But before we hop into the code, um, I wanted to show uh, what exactly frequency analysis is. So uh, I've actually been really excited about doing this video because so far, uh, I think in level one of the Python challenge and then the Kama Sutra cipher are the two ciphers we did. The rail fence cipher is also a cipher, but it falls under the uh, category of a transposition cipher, uh, which just means that the actual letters themselves aren't changed, the position of the letters are changed. Whereas something as like the Caesar shift cipher or the Kama Sutra cipher, um, the letters themselves, their positions remain the same, but uh, their representation changes. So, you know, A becomes W, for example, something like that. Um, and these are both monoalphabetic substitution ciphers. Uh, and so this was really interesting to me because this is our first time, instead of, you know, sending a message or uh, receiving a message and decrypting it, um, this is what happens if you're not supposed to be the person receiving the message. Um, so there's been this underlying assumption that when, uh, you know, I was writing the programs and I would have a line like, would you like to encrypt or decrypt the message? Obviously, if you're encrypting, then the message was meant for you and you intend for it to be received by someone. But that or decrypt section of, you know, that, that print statement um, suggests that you have a message and you're the intended decrypting uh, audience. You know, I would ask for a key in that case, like, okay, what's the key if you intend to decrypt? The user will input a, a key and then it would decrypt the message for them. But what happens if you want to know the contents of a message, but you're not the intended audience? Uh, and this is where frequency analysis comes in. And this part of the, uh, the code book is really interesting. I, I really enjoy like the historical side of like uh, cryptography and codes and ciphers. I think it's really interesting. Um, at the time, you know, these monoalphabetic substitution ciphers like the Caesar shift cipher were, you know, the premier cipher of the day. Uh, they would be used for military correspondence, political correspondence, uh, just if you wanted to keep your messages 
uh, safe and un unreadable, um, these were the ciphers that you would use. And so this section about um, Arab crypt analysts uh, really is interesting because the Islamic world, you know, obviously wasn't the first um, to invent the ciphers, but because of where they were academically um, and just they were so multidisciplinary uh, in their studies, whether it was religious studies, uh, mathematics, statistics, linguistics, because they were so multidisciplinary, they were able to invent frequency analysis. Um, so I'll just go over some of it. Um, like the, the most interesting part for me um, was this section, if I can find it, uh, just about how the Quran, you know, I haven't read the Quran, but it says that the Quran is a series of revelations of Muhammad. And so you had people who were studying, um, you know, who were students of Islam, uh, and just theologians in general who were trying to establish what order these revelations came in. So they would do things like count the frequencies of words in each revelation with the idea that certain words would be newer than others. So if a text had uh, a lot more newer words, then it must be a newer revelation, right? And so that's a sort of frequency analysis. You know, you're taking the frequencies of words and then trying to establish an order. Uh, and it goes further than that, and it says that they took that approach um, even further and were uh, analyzing the frequency of individual letters. And so in um, in Arabic, the most popular letters are A and L. You know, in English or in German or in French, they might be different letter, uh, different letters with different frequencies, but um, they took that idea of counting words to establish like a chronology for the Quran and then decided, hey, we can also do this for letters. And the book kind of like jumps from this, this statement that, you know, they took it a step further um, of uh, analyzing the frequency of letters. And then just it just goes straight into eventually the um, Al-Kindi invented crypt, uh, crypt analysis. But I just thought it was really cool that background. Um, and it's just kind of crazy to think that, uh, you know, something like a Caesar cipher, which to us, you know, I just finished watching Gravity Falls, for example, for example, and it uses a lot of like Caesar ciphers and stuff. And that's a kid's show, you know, and not that it can only be watched by children. Um, you know, I think it's a really great show. Uh, and a lot of adults enjoyed it as well. But a Caesar cipher is like enough encryption that like it takes some work to decrypt if you aren't super familiar with it, but by no means is it a real obstacle. But it comes down to the mathematics of it. So if we go here, uh, I already looked some of this up um, for the sake of time, but we have this number 26 factorial. What does that represent? If I wanted to uh, create a monoalphabetic substitution cipher, I could go with something like the Caesar cipher where you just shift the entire uh, alphabet uh, and you're just rotating a certain number of spaces, but you can also just shuffle it. I haven't done that on this channel just because uh, the monoalphabetic substitution ciphers kind of get repetitive, and I don't know, it just didn't seem that fun to me to do something like a Caesar shift and then also to do a monoalphabetic substitution video, and there only be like kind of slight changes. But if I wanted to construct one, right, you have your plain text alphabet, which is your standard A through Z. And then below that, you have to figure out which uh, letters are going to correspond to each plain text uh, letter. So if I was to do this for A, you would have 26 options. You can encrypt A as A. It might not be the best choice, but that's mathematically an option. So you have 26 options for A, you choose one, and now you have to choose uh, an option for B. So you have 25 now because you just chose a letter for A. And now you choose one for B, and then you have 24 for C because you already chose two, and so on and so forth. So if we were to represent this uh, in a more concise way, we get 26 factorial, which is all the possible uh, cipher alphabets that are at our disposal, uh, at least for monoalphabetic um, ciphers. So this comes out to the, be this big number, uh, 403 septillion, uh, and then like you know all this extra stuff. And that's a hard number to conceptualize. You know, we don't regularly encounter septillion. So I looked up the age of the universe. Um, this would actually be in seconds, right? 
um, 4.3 times 10 to the 17 seconds. Another number that's a little bit hard to conceptualize, right? But if we divide the total number of uh, monoalphabetic substitution ciphers that we have our, at our disposal, and then divide it by uh, the age of the universe in seconds, we get something a lot more uh, easy to understand. So this 9.37 times 10 to the eighth, that's about 900 million, um, about 900 million. What does that 900 million represent? If we were to take one second, you know, if we had a uh, enciphered message and we don't have the key, we're not the intended audience. Maybe we even forgot um, what the key was, right? But we don't know the key and we're trying to uh, decrypt the message. If we were to try uh, one cipher alphabet per second, uh, in the current age of the, our universe, we wouldn't have enough time, right? We would need 900 million total universes to detect every single uh, possible cipher alphabet. And that's absolutely crazy. You know, even though it's not a very strong form of encryption, you know, mathematically, it's just impossible, uh, at least on a worst case scenario, maybe, you know, the 12th uh, cipher key you try is the correct one. But a worst case scenario of having to test every one, uh, you know, the current life of the universe isn't enough time uh, if you were to check one cipher key per second. Uh, and you would need almost a billion universes to do so, which is just like crazy to me. So that's why, you know, uh, back in the day, it was considered like, you know, worthy of using for top secret information because it just wasn't possible to crack until we have frequency analysis. Um, so now we can kind of get into um, the code. I already, like I said, I have it up uh, just because it was like the last video was just way too long. Uh, there was a lot of pauses I was doing and stuff just because I was trying to wrap my head around what I did the first time I did it. Uh, and so this, I think, will go a lot smoother. So we have this secret.py. And in secret.py, I have a plain text message. Um, I'm going to leave it uh, hidden just for the sake of, like, mystery or whatever. Um, but I'm going to show what the ciphertext is. So we're going to comment out all of this stuff because we don't need it. Uh, um, and then we're going to comment out decrypt because we're not there yet. And so if we run this, uh, what happened? Encrypt. And, oh, I commented out the encrypt method. No, it's right here. Oh, I commented out the these. All right, I'll leave this. I commented out this uh, import statement because I wasn't using uh, pretty print yet, but it can stay. So this is our cipher text, right? Um, and, you know, I've done uh, frequency analysis by hand. Uh, I took a cryptography course before uh, when I was younger, back before I even started programming, I think. Um, and so, like, our class did it by hand, and it's very, not easy, but it's not, um, you know, impossible to do something like this cipher uh, text, like, decrypting this by hand. Uh, but it did present a challenge doing this with Python. So just as a review before we get into the decryption, the encryption is pretty simple. Um, we have some sort of plain text, which we get from this secret.py file. Uh, alphabet is just the string not ASCII lowercase. String is just a uh, module that has a bunch of string constants, and one of them is just a, B, C, D, E, F, G, et cetera, all the way to Z as one single string, uh, just lowercase. So we make that alphabet a list. And the reason we make it a list is because I want to shuffle it. So random has a method called shuffle, and it shuffles a list in place. And even though string is kind of list-like in the way that we can you know, index it and access things, um, the string itself, you can't like... I, don't, I think the error you get is like string doesn't support uh, item assignment. So you have to convert it to a list beforehand if you want to shuffle it up. Um, so I convert it to a list. And then this line may or may not be unnecessary. I just convert it back into a string by joining everything with uh, just an empty string in between. So we get one single string. Uh, that's our cipher key. And uh, yeah, and this may or may not be necessary, but I just stuck with it. Uh, so then this whole point of this method is to encrypt our plain text into ciphertext. 
So we have this empty string for ciphertext, and then we just iterate through the plain text. And I lowered it just because, like I said before, uh, I'm following uh, the convention that was set in uh, the code book by Simon Singh, where uh, plain text is lowercase and then in ciphertext is uppercase. So we just iterate through our uh, plain text. It's all lowered. I could have done it up here, I just didn't. Um, we iterate through our plain text. If the character that we're currently at uh, is an alpha character, so if it's just an uh, if it's a letter, you know, so that we're excluding our white spaces, our numbers, our punctuation, anything like that, um, then what we do is we take the ORD of the character, and ORD just returns the Unicode. Um, so for example, lowercase a is 97, lowercase b is 98, lowercase c is 99, uh, and so on and so forth, right? And it takes it the distance from the ORD of lowercase a. So for example, if we have um, the current character is b, ORD of b, lowercase b returns 98, and 98 minus the ORD of lowercase a, which is 97, uh, the difference is one. So what this is saying is um, B in the plain text is indexed as the first letter, right? A is zero because this is zero based indexing. So A is zero, B is one, C is two, etc. right? So B is usually the first letter in the plain text. Return whatever the first letter in the cipher key is, and that's B's uh, like in like B's cipher partner or whatever you want to call it, right? Or corresponding letter that it gets encrypted as. Uh, and then we just upper whatever that letter is. And after we do all of this, we add it into the cipher text. If it's not a letter, we just add it as is. We don't um, change it at all. And then that gets returned so that we can save it into a variable and then print it out. Um, so if we, oops. If we look back here, that's what happens here, right? Um, we have some letter, it took the distance um, from lowercase a after that letter itself was lowered and then said, okay, uh, this letter is the nth letter of the alphabet. Find the nth letter in our cipher key string and that letter just happened to be k. And so k was added to the cipher text and then we continue with h um, and then a space was present uh, so that didn't get altered at all. That remained the same and it gets added to the ciphertext and then it continues. Um, also, the way this set is set up, every time you run it, you're going to get a different ciphertext uh, because you're having a different cipher key generated uh, by random dot shuffle. So that's pretty standard. Um, nothing terribly new from what I've done before if you uh, watch my other videos, uh, but that's just the encryption. The real pain comes in the decrypt part. So it's almost like having to define a bunch of like, uh, maybe not words, but like tricks um, that the computer can use to identify, or maybe not tricks, but rules that the computer can use to identify certain letters. Um, so decrypt starts with this idea that uh, you have a potential cipher key. You don't know what this um, cipher key is, right? That's the whole point. Like, we don't know what the key is. We're trying to figure out the key so that we can decrypt the message, right? Potential cipher key is uh, a dictionary, and it loops through this string ASCII uppercase, which is just like the opposite um, of the ASCII lowercase. So instead of A, B, C, D, et cetera, to Z, all lowercase, it's just A, B, C, D, et cetera, to Z, all uppercase. Um, and so it takes every one of those characters and for each character, it adds it into this dictionary so that the letter is the key and then the value is uh, a set of alphabet letters. So for example, if we were to look at Let's uh, get rid of all of this and just print out potential cipher key. So pretty print dot pretty print uh, potential cipher key. And we print this out. Oh, where'd it go? Uh, is this still? Yep, I still commented out. So let's uncomment that. Um, so you get something like this, right? So for every single letter, 
uh, we're currently at the bottom. So V has this set of uh, alphabet characters, so letters, A through Z, right? V has the same thing. Um, oh, that was U. So U has A through Z, V has A through Z, W, A through Z, X, Y, Z, they all have A through Z. And the reason I took this approach um, is because I kind of had it in mind of like Sudoku. So if we go here uh, and I look up Sudoku and I actually spell it correctly and look up a picture. So this is kind of like a Sudoku. Um, yeah, we have a Sudoku puzzle here. Um, and you have all of these numbers, some of them are established, and then you have all these numbers that aren't established represented by these blank squares. Every, uh, every square exists in a row, a column, and then this three by three square. And every three by three row and column can have the numbers one through nine, uh, but you can't have duplicates. So one way to approach doing a Sudoku problem is to write all of the missing numbers in these blank squares and then systematically cross them out, right? So one would go in each of these, uh, two wouldn't because it's already present, then three, four, five is here, six, and then eight, right? And then you would go through and compare to everything that you have, right? So eight can't go here because there's an eight here. And it also can't go in this row because there's an eight here. So eight can only go in these two spots. So, you know, if I were to do a Sudoku or like, you know, another puzzle like a Ken Ken or something like that, you start erasing numbers that aren't possible. And then when you get to uh, a number, say, for some reason, we deduce that eight can't go here. Then the only square that would have an eight in it is this one right here. And that would mean that eight has to go in that spot. You know, every three by three, every row, every column has to have the numbers one through eight. And if you have one number in a square by itself in your notes, uh, that's the number that that square has to be. So I took a similar approach. Uh, and instead of having any like letters um, to work off of, you know, any givens, we're not given anything. Uh, this isn't like a, a partially decrypted message. This is a totally um, encrypted message that we don't know any of the key. So every letter is potentially like one of the 26 letters here. Uh, and then our job is to start like whittling it down uh, to something that, uh, to a state where some letters only have one possible letter in them. And the hope originally was just that every letter would get to that point, but I soon realized I don't think that uh, was feasible. So we can get rid of this pretty print of the key since now we know how it works. Um, and then afterwards you just get like, um, you see we have these three methods, deduce A or I, deduce A, I or T, uh, and deduce H, E, H, and T. So I'll explain each one. Once I explain uh, A or I, the the next two will make more sense. Um, so the way deduce A or I works, where is it? Okay, it's right here. So in the English language, there are only two words um, that have, uh, there are only two words that are only one letter long. Now, I think technically this can change with context. You know, maybe you're reading a redacted uh, military file uh, and it has the contents of, you know, some agents who are undercover, right? Um, and so in order to save their identity, you don't use their actual names, but instead use their first uh, letter of their name as their name, right? So, you know, I'm Cocoa Butter Coder. To protect my identity, uh, I'm referred to as C in a document. Um, that would change the frequency, or not the frequency so much, but it would change the fact that there should only be two words um, that are only one letter along. You can still deduce from frequency analysis that, you know, um, like if my, if my name is only referred to once, okay, this is for some reason a lone letter in here by itself. But say I was referred to a bunch of times, it would mess with the frequency analysis, and this method wouldn't really work. Um, the way that it should. But this is under the assumption that we're working with a, you know, a standard English document um, and that uh, the, the, 
the truth remains that only two words are one letter long, A and I, right? So I have this empty list called one letter words, and I have already imported RE to uh, create a regex um, that can find these one letter words. So the regex is pretty simple. Um, you have an empty space and then just a class of uppercase letters and then another empty space. This was also something that I was a little conflicted with because for like you could have something like uh, mother may I, you know, maybe that's not super common English, but it's an instance where you have one letter at the end of a sentence um, and that would uh, that would be a one letter word, but it wouldn't fall into the pattern of space, one letter word space, right? And so I tried it originally with, you know, um, what did I do? I did anything, let me move this, the cursor, anything that wasn't a letter, um, then one letter word, and then anything that wasn't a letter again. Um, and I think it should actually be A through Z, right? Um, because anything that's not uppercase includes the, or includes lowercase and that's not what we want. Um, so the problem with this though, is that you get stuff like, um, and this should also be lowercase A through Z at the end. But the problem with this is like, now you start getting the endings of contractions. So in our text, there were only, uh, there was only like one contraction used. So maybe it was like a, apostrophe S if we were to decrypt it, but it's possible in English for it also be, to be um, apostrophe T, apostrophe D. And I didn't want to pick up on stuff like that because it still fits of, um, you know, like a one letter word followed by something that's not a letter uh, in most cases, a space or like a period, and then follow before by something that's not a letter apostrophe. Uh, so even though it's, you lose out on stuff like mother may I, which is correct, um, even though it might not be super popular, you know, it's just, I thought it was just easier uh, to go the route of just using space, uh, one letter, uppercase letter, um, and then another space. If you know a better way of doing uh, the rejects for that, I'd be all ears, maybe piping it with some ors or stuff like that. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. I'm still, excuse me, fairly new to like using rejects in my programming. Um, I think it's really cool and it's super powerful, um, but I'm still on the basics. So like I said, if you have a, a better way or suggestion, I'm all ears. So if we go back to this space, um, uppercase letter space went to, whoa, uh, went too far back. Um, that's our rejects, we compile it, and then we create a match object that finds all of the instances in our ciphertext that match this pattern. Um, we iterate through that match object because using the find all uh, returns a list, and we uh, add that into our one letter words. So let's, just print this out to see uh, what's in it. And then we strip it down just because we have this white space on either side. So if we print um, one letter words and then scroll down, I hope I didn't print this twice. No, I didn't. So in this ciphertext here, we have M I M I I I. Uh, and so these are gonna represent A and I. I might be I and M might be A, or M might be I and I might, wait, and M might be I and then I might be A. Um, but we're not certain. We just know that these two are probably A and I because they're one letter and they're by themselves. And so what we can do is then change that list um, into a set. And the reason I didn't uh, uh, make this a set originally is because I don't think there's a method to add to a set. The set has to um, exist already. Uh, there was no like append version for set. So I just made it all into a list and then uh, converted that into a set. And so what I like about sets, um, at least I know for me, they're super useful because of certain properties like 
sets uh, can be sorted, you know, sets uh, remove duplicates. Uh, I was once in a programming competition where we had to find like the highest value uh, and we didn't need duplicates. Um, and so we could have done something uh, like pro like coding out the logic um, to find what the current highest thing was um, and then uh, getting rid of ignoring the duplicates or stuff like that. Um, and I might be explaining this wrong, you know, I, it was, I remember the, the context of the, the problem or whatever, um, but not so much the details. Uh, but I just know that we were trying to figure out how, the best way to do this. And I just suggested using a set because for a set, you say use a tree set, it automatically sorts it according to its natural order. And then all you have to do is pop off the last uh, object if it's ascending uh, and you automatically have the greatest value for whatever uh, is in the set. Uh, and I might not, not explained it well, it might seem like that was overcomplicating. I just remember when we were doing the programming competition, it wasn't an overcomplication. It was actually a massive simplification uh, from someone else's alternative. Um, and so sets are really cool. Um, sets and dictionaries, I'm a big fan. And so I converted it to a set because I know from set theory and like discrete mathematics that set uh, sets have certain properties. So now that we know what our one letters are, we can go through all of our um, potential cipher keys. And that was our Sudoku-like list of what each letter could be. And this just says if that character that we're on, so remember it was like A is all of these letters, B is all of these letters, C is all of these letters. If that character is exists in one letter words, uh, then we're going to intersect it with the set A or I. So what the intersection does, it says, okay, here are two sets. Uh, what do they have in common, right? You think about a Venn diagram. This is that middle portion, like, you know, where is that overlap? And so um, if we look back in our terminal, M and I, so for I comes before M, so it'll get to uh, I and then intersect the A through Z set with the set uh, A through I, and so, now I only has the letters A and I because that's what's common in between the two sets. And when it gets to M, it will do the same thing. Any other letter uh, will instead be a uh, difference. So it'll take set number one, um, which has A through Z, and then difference it with the set A and I. So this will remove A and I from set number one, which is what we're what we want. You know, this is basically saying this intersection is saying, OK, these two letters um, represent either A or I. We don't know like which right now, but we can whittle it down to that. And every other letter is saying remove A or I because we know what two letters are A and I. Every other letter is not that. So we take the difference. And if we were to print out um, pretty print dot. And I'm using pretty print just because otherwise uh, it'll like print the um, the dictionary all on one line and it's kind of hard to see. Um, so if we pretty print potential cipher key, I have something else. I guess I don't need this uh, one letter words right here. But we pretty print this out, right? So, um, if I scroll up, uh, that's why I had it. Let me put this back. So I'll comment that out. And let's scroll down to where we are. So we have this text, our cipher text, and it's deduced that E and W um, represent A uh, and I. So for example, the letter A, A and I have been removed from this set of possible letters. B, the same thing, A and I have been removed, C, the same thing. So we go to E, the only letters present in that set are A and I. Uh, and if we scroll all the way down to W, the same thing, A and I are the only letters present in that set, while for every other set, they have been removed. Um, and so this is like the first one I decided to go with because there are only two words in the English language that are one letter long. It was kind of like a given or a freebie, if you will. So I can get rid of this line. Uh, and then the next one that I went on to was deduce A, E, or T. 
Um, and so if we look, I think I have it up already. We have uh, the whole the whole idea here is that we're using frequency analysis, right? Deducing A or I isn't really frequency analysis. Uh, it's just kind of like uh, like the Sudoku thing, right? Um, you don't really need to know the frequencies of the numbers in a Sudoku puzzle. You just kind of use process of elimination. But uh, in the English language, the three most common letters are E, T, and A. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm not too sure of is like where they're getting these numbers from. Um, because if you if you go back to uh, the code book, and we scroll it down, these frequencies are very different. It says E has 12.7. T has 9.1 and A is 8.2. Uh, and, you know, T, you know, these are kind of off by only uh, tenths of percentages, while this is off by a whole percentage point. So I don't know where uh, they're getting these numbers exactly. The code book was written in 2000, so maybe, you know, someone's done an updated uh, analysis of a bunch of text and they came to a new conclusion. Um, you know, one of the things they said in the code book is you have to be wary of the context of your ciphertext. If you know that it's a military text, certain things are going to be removed, like uh, kind of personal identification, uh, maybe certain pronouns like he, she, it's going to be a little bit more impersonal. So certain, or maybe like articles are removed. You have to be cognizant of the context of, you know, what you're using. Um, so I don't know how these numbers were formed or the ones in the, the code book for that matter. Um, but we do know that E, T, and A are the most popular, right? And one of the things that was mentioned was that don't, you can't do a one-to-one -one translation, right? Because then uh, the, uh, the code wouldn't be strong at all, you know? Like it's already not that strong, but it'd be way too easy to break. Um, and that was kind of one of the breakthroughs of like frequency analysis when, um, when uh, Al Kendi did it, was just kind of looking and like even if you have a message, uh, say you have this plain text English, right, and you count up all the letters, E is going to be the most common, followed by T, followed by A. But these are kind of just averages, right? It varies from text to text, but just on average, these are the most common in English. And obviously, he was looking at uh, Arabic, but the principle holds for English, right? So even if you encrypt it, all you've done is just change what letter becomes the most common one. Um, so if it was originally E, E is just represented by some new letter now. Um, so say it's K in our ciphertext. So now we can, with some reason, maybe say that E is K. But the thing is, because these are only averages, right? Um, you know, it might not always be E. Maybe for somehow it is T. You know, maybe it's not exactly, if we were to go back, uh, to this one, maybe we look at our text and we, we're using this list to figure out um, which letter is which, and we find our, our highest count, but it ends up being at a frequency of like 11.9%, right? That doesn't automatically mean that that's not E, you know, maybe it is E, or maybe because it's that high, it's not, you know, it's not necessarily E, these are just averages. But one thing that we can take note is that E is around 11%, uh, T is around 9, so that's 20%, and then A is around 8, so that's 28%, so almost 30%, right? Um, if all numbers occurred at the same relative frequency, uh, since we have 20, or not numbers, but letters, since we have 26 letters, that's uh, 100 divided by 26, which is almost 100 divided by 24, so that's 4. Each letter should appear about 4% of the time. So three letters should occur like 12%, uh, but instead these three occur 30%. So even though we can't be sure because these are just averages and it varies on the context of the text, we can be certain that if we find the top three, or not certain, but we can have more certainty that if we find the top three uh, most common letters in a ciphertext, that those probably represent E, T, and A. And that's what this method here, deuce E, A, or T does. It takes a text uh, and creates a frequency table. And it just goes through the ciphertext. Uh, it ignores all the white space, the punctuation, um, any numbers if they're present, whatever, just not a letter, and counts them up and adds it to our frequency table. 
um, and the set default. Uh, I don't know why I just really like this method just because uh, it takes what would have been like an if um, like an if statement with some logic in the code block and just reduces it down to a method. Uh, basically, the first run through of uh, of or not the run through, but the first encounter it has with a letter, it adds it to the dictionary and you can just give it a default. So you just give it a zero. Um, and then the next line here, frequency table at that character, it adds one. And so the next time that it encounters, so the second time and all the times that follow afterward, uh, this set default doesn't apply anymore. Uh, it's already been updated. So this is skipped and then it adds one anyway. So it's cool because you don't have to write the if statement for the dictionary or anything like that. You just use set default. So you create this frequency table with your ciphertext. Uh, and then I convert the values into a list. I call that frequencies. The reason I do this is because, like I said, lists have certain properties um, that you can use. And one of those is the sort method. Um, and so frequencies are values itself. For some reason returns a dictionary object. Uh, so a frequency table is already a dictionary, but values is also like some weird like dictionary object i guess so you have to convert it to a list you make a copy because we need our original frequencies in the order that we have them um, because those that order corresponds uh to the letters so if a is 13 b is 6 and then c is 1 uh and we sort that it'll be 1 6 uh and 13 but we want to remember the original correlation of 13 6 and 1 uh, so we sort a copy, we create a copy, and then we sort the copy, and then everything we're doing uh, is like frequencies-wise referred to the copy. So we take the three highest, we just take the slice of whatever the last three are, uh, and that's what this does. It takes the third to last, second to last, and the first to last, um, and adds that into a new list called three highest frequencies. We don't know which ones these correspond to yet, but thankfully we save our original frequency so we can make that correlation. So we have a new list called three most common letters. And so what we need to do is iterate through our three highest frequencies and find what the corresponding letter is. So frequency table, uh, which is a dictionary, has uh, a couple methods because dictionaries have um, a few methods. The ones we're using here are values, which returns all the values. So in this case, that's the frequencies of the letters. Uh, and then you can also return the keys. So in this case, that's just the letters itself. So keys uh, gets returned and like values for some reason is a weird dictionary object. So you convert it to a list. And now that it's a list, you can use our square bracket indexing. So you go, uh, you take whatever frequency of three highest frequencies that you're currently at, you pass it into the index of your original frequencies and whatever place that is, is what the key is. So let's use an example. Um, actually, let me print out uh, the frequency table just so that it's easy to see. So print frequency table. And if we scroll down, okay. So you can ignore this, this is from the uh, A or I method. But this is our frequencies for all the letters that appear in our frequency table here. All right, these are all the letters, the frequencies of all the letters in our ciphertext here, right? And I already know because I've done this a couple times that Y is the most frequent one, or not Y necessarily, I didn't know that, but that the most frequent was gonna be 121. Um, so if we just collapse this a little bit so that it's easy to see. Right, we take our frequency in this case 121 um, because that's the that's one of the three highest frequencies. We don't know if that's E, T, or A, but we know that it's one of them. Um, so we take 121, we pass it into our frequencies, uh, our frequencies value, um, our frequencies list. Sorry, right? So frequencies list. If we this is our frequency table. If we do print um, the list of frequency table dot values and run it again. 
right? So this is our frequency table, and then these are all the corresponding values. It keeps the order that was in the frequency table, just gets rid of the keys. So 121 has a index here, and we can say that because, let's also print the keys, So if we print the keys, we can see that R is the first, 63 is the first. So 63 goes in our values, R goes in our keys. Uh, M is the f second, and then 30 is the second, so 30 and then M. So it, it does this the whole way through. So we can take whatever index of 121, and because the keys have to be the same length, because every key has a corresponding value, um, because it has to be the same length, we can take whatever the index of the frequency is, and then say this, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So we can say that the 6 um, the six value in our uh, frequencies is the letter that we want, which is going to be the 6 value in our keys. And that's all that this does here um, in our deduce. Where is it? takes whatever that frequency is, finds whatever the index of it in the frequency list, and that returns a number. So in this case of 121, that'll be six. And it says, okay, whatever the six uh, item in our keys uh, list is, that's the letter that we wanna add to our three most common letters. So like in this case, uh, 121 belongs to Q this time. So Q gets added to three most common letters. Um, and then we can get rid of this and then just print three most common letters to see what's inside. Oops, three most common letters. So in this, wait, what happened? Oh, screwed up the indentation somewhere. So in this case, these are our A and I's and these would be our three most common letters of M, J, and P. Now you can already see these are our A and I's. So Z and M are a candidate for A and I. We don't know currently what they are, but we also have a function that's deducing E, T, or A, and M belongs to both of them. So M is A. We don't know what J and P are. We know that they're E or T. We can't be certain of which one, but now we also know that Z is I because this was A or I and we figured out A, so now we know I. So in a similar way to what we did uh, in our A or I uh, method, we use the intersection of A, E, and, A, e, and T for these three uh, characters, and then for every other character, we take the difference, which just removes A, E, or T from being viable candidates. So if we print, uh, get rid of this print line, and then we print out um, our new potential cipher key. So if we look at Z, Z, A has been removed, I has been removed, E has been removed, T is no longer here, uh, and that's it. Let's scroll up, um, just because since these keys are random, I don't know uh, which is which. But P has been deduced to be A. So in the first deduce A or I, this was A or I. And then in the next round of deduce E, A, or T, uh, A was found to be the common one between, or P was found to be the common one between them. So that's A. And then scrolling up some more, I was I, which is not a good cipher key since it's a pretty popular number. So you wouldn't want to translate it back into itself like that. Um, but it happens. E is translated to T or E, which hopefully, is, well, again, not the best uh, paired up. B is also T or E. Um, so that's that for A, E, or T. Uh, and it's kind of similar. It's just a different process. This one is actually using frequencies as opposed to A or I. Um, just because A or I is more of the nature of how those words exist in English, whereas E uh, a or T is uh, more of just like the frequency side of things. And so the last one that I did was uh, deduce E, H, and T. And the reason this is an N uh, is because we already have our E 
in our T here. Uh, and what this method does is basically is finding the does in um, a ciphertext. So three letter words, if you look up like the most common three letter words, don't always get the same results, which is one of the problems I was running into. Like it's not always a one to one like agreeance, like okay, does the most common word. Sometimes it's an and, you know, sometimes e is the has the highest frequency, sometimes, you know, I think I looked up one that had like R as being one of the top three. So you just have to be like wary of stuff like that. Um and making sure that the frequency uh table that you've assembled um, is based on text that relate closely to the one that you're analyzing. So the is usually the most common word in the English language. Um, so what this uh, rejects does is it finds three letter words only, just the three letter words by themselves. Um, and I might've actually been able to use this word boundary for uh, the rejects up here. I don't know why I used it here and not here. Um, but I'll, I'll try that later. Uh, but we have these boundaries and it just finds three letter words. Uh, that's it. Unfortunately, this does include like underscore and uh, letters. So this isn't the best. This should actually be like um, just A through Z three times, I think. So I'll just change that because that, that does need to be changed. So uh, similar to the one we used before for our A, E, or T, uh, it finds all of the three-letter words that match and then puts it into this list. And then we create a frequency table specifically for three-letter words. So in uh, this method, we're counting the letters themselves. This one, we're counting the words uh, because the is usually the most common word. So we're looking for the one that's the most common uh, word in our frequency table. So I have an empty vari I have a variable called the candidate, uh, which is literally like the candidate for the, uh, and it's just an empty string, and then our highest frequency is zero. Um, so frequency tables uh, or just dictionaries more generally, uh, as well as key and item, they have an, a key and value methods. They also have an items method, which returns uh, your key and your, va your values. Um, and allows it to be iterated through. So this is just saying if the frequency of whatever our current word is uh, in the frequency table is higher than the highest frequency, then now set that to the new highest frequency and whatever that word is, that's the new candidate for the. Um, so it'll go through all of the words and basically just find the one that occurs the most and whatever one occurs the most is the the candidate. Um, and so now we go back into our potential cipher key uh, and we see if the character is in our the candidate. So let's print out our the candidate here. Print the candidate. So if we go to the bottom of our, this will let me scroll. If we go here, this is saying that TQN is the candidate for the uh, in this text. And again, T to T is not the best uh, enciphering scheme to go with, but it's random, so it happens. Um, it's saying, go through our potential cipher key, uh, which has our, you know, Sudoku, like A is poss possibly any of these letters, B is possibly any of these letters, um, etc. If whatever letter we're currently on is one of the the candidate, uh, then we need to analyze its position. So in this case, um, T, uh, if we were on the letter T, T is one of the letters in the candidate, right? So if the character equals the first letter um, of the candidate, then intersect that with T, which is basically saying that letter is T. So in this case, T exists in the candidate. Uh, the character T is the first letter of T, and so intersect whatever was all the possibilities for T with the lowercase t. And that basically says, what's the uh, similarity between these two? And the similarity is going to be T, which means that now T holds only T as a possible letter. This is repeated for the second one. So this Q uh, will be intersected with lowercase h. And this N will be intersected with lowercase e. 
any other letter. It's just a difference with E, H, and T, like we did for A and I or E, H, or E, A, and T. And by this method, uh, we have five letters that we know for certain. We have E, H, T, A, and I. Um, so if we print our potential cipher key here, let me show my indentation is right. Pretty print dot pretty print um, our potential cipher key. And did I print? Yeah, I don't need this. We print this. So now A is in here. E is in here, uh, I is in here, H is in here, and T is in here. And if we scroll up, X equals T, R equals E, M equals H, and there should be one more. Yeah, two more. B is A and C is I. Um, and then this is where I stopped, honestly, because it's like... In my eyes, uh, well, I mean, there there is more code here. Uh, if we uncomment this out, what this basically does is the, uses what we have to get a partial decryption. Um, so let me space that. And then I think I didn't get rid, yep, got to get rid of this. So if we print this out, we get a partial decryption based on whatever is currently in the cipher key. Um, so we know that this letter here is a lowercase a, and this is a the. Um, these L's might actually be uh, L's. This X is probably an S. Um, we can kind of look through and figure out, but this is the problem that I was having of like, um, I don't know, it just didn't seem like the best way to go about this of trying to figure out all of these rules, um, you know, for uh, any per particular text. It's kind of easy to do if you're looking through um, and doing it by hand, like I can see that this B is probably an O, like this is probably two. Um, and then the Z, you know, it could be a T, but we already know T. Uh, it could be an S, uh, but this is an S. So you kind of have to start weighing things like, okay, you know, and, you know, part of this is looking at charts, but uh, charts of frequencies of words and of letters is these most commonly are more common than as, like as might be a pretty common two letter word. Um, is these more common? Like uh, this Z is actually probably a, uh, an N, like a A N D, but then there's A R E, you know, which is also a pretty common word. But we already know E, so you know that kind of eliminates that. Um, I T A, you know, that might be uh, that might be. Um, like this here, this is I, Z, uh, that could be it, but we know T, it could be S, but this might be S, and then I guess a D or an M. There's just so many rules that I felt like would needed to be coded, uh, and it's not even so much, like, I. there's something I do strive, strive for, for, like, simplicity and, like, a certain sexiness to your code, like, coming up with a clever way or a concise way, or just most importantly, a readable way. But it just seemed like it would get really repetitive. Um, and so I kind of just was looking ahead, um, and it just seemed like it was too much to, you know, you know, when it's easy for us to deduce whether or not um, what letter belongs to which, you know, we understand context, we understand what words are probably you know, close to other words and stuff like that. Um, but ultimately, this program probably would serve better as an assistant, you know. Maybe it goes through these first three by itself, uh, and then um, the user also has a hand in inputting, like, um, this letter is probably this one, try this out, and then the uh, program returns a partially deciphered text and then asks the user if they want to keep it or 
you know, if they want to revert back to what it was beforehand, something like that, just a, a team effort. Because I just feel like there's too much uh, context involved um, of English and how English operates for this to be uh, as concise of a program as I want. And that led me to actually look up whether or not uh, there were any, you know, this seems like something maybe machine learning would be uh, more well suited for. I'm not, I don't have any experience with machine learning. It's something that I would, uh, wouldn't mind like dipping my toes into if I found some like an application that interests me. Uh, but there is some uh, crypt analysis of like pretty simple ciphers such as Caesar ciphers or uh, substitution ciphers and using neural networks to like kind of predict what the uh, cipher key is. So I'll post this in the description because I thought this was pretty cool. But that's the end of this video, at least part one at least. The next video is going to be using a different approach that I found uh, using something called quadgrams, which are just four letter sequences of words to give a text a score and see how likely it is to be English. Uh, I got better results, but not as good. Um, but if you're interested, you know, definitely check that out as well. Thank you for watching um, if you made it this long, and I hope you enjoy. See you guys, and bye.